I'll first introduce our keynote speaker, Paul Ivanov. And Paul is currently now a steering, uh, steering council member of Jupiter and also a senior software engineer for Bloomberg and mainly working on Jupiter or IPython related open source projects. And today he's gonna t uh, have a talk about programming language tourism and live Python and see the whole world. So let's welcome our captain and enjoy the journey. Thank you so much. Um, really glad to be here. Thank you all for being here so early in the morning. I'm getting started early. Should I wait or this is good? 922 is good? We're rolling. Everyone feels good? All right. I feel. Working hour. Yeah, that's right. All right, people trickling in. I love this. So thank you so much for being here. This is my first time in Taipei, so I'm really enjoying my time here. Really excited to talk with all of you. Thank you. No, thank you. Thank you for being here. Yeah, absolutely. Absolutely. So the title of my talk is Programming Language Tourism. And uh, I'm going to start off kind of slow, and uh, you'll see eventually where I'm going. But for now, just sort of bear with me. Um, and will my pointer bear with me? So I was born in Moscow. I'm in Moscow. I'm five years old, and it's dark outside. It's winter, and it's very, very cold. I'm shivering. I'm tapping my feet to keep myself warm. And I'm doing that because I'm with my older brother. He's two years older than me, Misha's here, and uh, we're, we're waiting. We're waiting, and it's cold, and it's been hours. And eventually, mom comes to pick us up. We get home. And even though I was bundled up, and my brother made sure I had my hat on me, he missed the spot. My left ear was exposed, and it was the size of a fist. It was really cold. For the next 15 years of my life, whenever I was embarrassed, nervous, or if it was cold, the ear would swell up again. Okay. If we start thinking about programming languages as places, we can have analogies that allow us to assess how we're doing in a place, how we feel about a place. And so if I was young the way that we were young when we were programmers, and I was thinking about how cold it was without realizing that my ear was being hurt at the time, What happens is that all of us can experience these things. And it can be a traceback error. It can be an indentation error. You don't know that it hit you, but it stops you in your tracks when you're a newbie. And your brother is only two years older than you. He doesn't really necessarily know better. Okay, so that is what I'm going to talk about today. That is as serious as it's going to get, so that was the most uncomfortable it'll be. <laughs> so here we go. About me, I am uh, a senior software developer at Bloomberg. I am on the Jupyter Steering Council. I am a core Matplotlib developer, and my contact information is on there, and I'll repeat it again at the end. Um, I'm actually... Uh, supposed to be working on Matplotlib release 3.2.0. 3 Don't tell Tom Caswell that I'm here, OK? It's just between you and me. Like, by the time this goes up on YouTube, it'll be done, but it's not done yet. So where are we? We're in PyCon, Taiwan, specifically in room zero of the Humanities and Social Sciences building. And that's how I know I'm at a Python conference, because the indexing starts at zero. That usually gets a bigger laugh, but <laughs> thank you, yeah, yeah. No, you don't have to clap, no, but just, just a bigger laugh. Yeah, it's good. 
Like I mentioned, this is my first time in Taipei, and so a question that we can ask each other, right, when somebody says, oh, I'm visiting here, where are you coming from? And there are different scales to answering that. Being a Jupiter person, I might answer, oh, planet Earth. <laughs> but then you start to zoom in, the United States, California, San Francisco, or the Bay Area, as though there's only one Bay Area. The East Bay, specifically, is where I live. And then you might get into the cities of whether it's Oakland or Berkeley. And then within that, right, you can also say, which part? Are you on the south side? Are you in downtown? Where are you? And so I've lived in 17 different places that I can count on in just two countries. So most of that was in the United States, just two places in, in Russia. And we will now go through each one of them in excruciating detail. No, I'm not going to do that. Occupational identity. It's a very common question when you meet somebody is, what kind of work do you do? And again, depending on who's asking you that question, your answer might be, well, it's computers. That's all you need to know. And you know, if you're feeling more generous or the time allows for it, well, I program. I'm a programmer. I do Python programming. And when you're here at PyCon Taiwan, you might say, oh, well, I do scientific Python. And if you're really getting into it, if they got excited about that, well, I do Matplotlib or Jupyter or NumPy, right? All these things. And again, you can say, which part of that code base do you concentrate on? Because Jupyter's a big project, Matplotlib's a big project, NumPy's a big project. So programmer identity, a lot of us will say that I am a Python programmer. So let's dig into that, what that means, because the title of my talk is, you know, the subtitle is Leave Python and See the World. So why are we doing that? So Stack Overflow trends. So not a perfect measure. Not everyone goes on Stack Overflow, but a lot of people do. And so let's look at the activity there. So here's what it looks like. Over the years, in the last 10 years, Python has become the top tagged type of question on Stack Overflow, okay? So if I gave this talk a year ago, that wouldn't have been true. JavaScript was still ahead, but now it's Python. Yeah, that's something to be excited about, absolutely. The uh, Stack Overflow developer survey from last year it comes out around November, so this year's hasn't been released yet, but uh, in answering the question of what is the most wanted language that people want to learn, it's Python. So this is for a language that you don't already use in your work and you don't already know. What's the next language that you would like to learn? Vast majority, a quarter of the respondents would pick Python over any other language to, to learn next. So there's a lot of us and there's more coming, right? And then the final piece from the Stack Overflow data is what is the most loved programming language? So this means that I'm programming in this language and I don't see myself switching to another language. I'd rather work in that particular language. So Rust is number one, they're fanatics. Kotlin's number two and Python is number three, not too far behind. So there's lots of people that are programming Python today. They're happy and there's more of us coming, right? So take slightly different tack. Can we double check our data? Is that really happening? So let's look at GitHub, so more open source things, right? Not every, not all development is open source, but it will give us some insights about it. So the top programming language by repositories created was JavaScript, second is Java, and third is Python. So again, there's a lot of Python and open source. Big surprise there. I bet you didn't know that, right? And here's a chart over the years for contributors. So the top number of contributors for a Python project, uh, for a project is JavaScript. There's lots of those on GitHub. Java, again, and Python has been at the number three spot since 2015. Okay, but we can break that down by region, and you can see that in some places, that orange line, it's in the number two spot in North America and Oceania, okay? So even though Python is number three overall, in some places it, is, it takes the number two spot. And again, growth by contributor. So this is year over year. How, how, how fast is it growing? 
Python, even though it's already one of the big ones, continues to grow fast. You'll notice JavaScript's not on that list, but what is is TypeScript, right? So a lot of people that know JavaScript are shifting away to TypeScript, okay? Um, and then, that's interesting, Go made this list, and Go made a previous list as well, so we'll get back to Go in a little bit. But Python, again, seems to be a great language to be in. So why would you leave Python? And some of you are new, and I'm hoping that you can point other people, new people that are trying to get started in programming to the stock or to this idea of thinking about programming languages as places um, to help them understand that that first choice, it matters, but it doesn't matter a whole lot. Um, because you can't go wrong with learning Python. That's what I'm trying to summarize here. So I'm not knocking Python. Python is great. And if you just got here, perfect. It's great. But occasionally, you know, especially if you're using Python for work, you might want to go on a programming vacation. Right? You might want to, again, thinking about programming languages as places, you might want to go somewhere else. I work in California. Sometimes I go on vacations in California, but sometimes I like to go somewhere else. Sometimes I get to go somewhere else for work. Okay, my frozen ear already alluded to this, but it was an indentation error. It was an indentation error in code that a lab mate and I shared, and his text editor did not give any indication, it did, did not give the ability to switch between tabs and spaces, and so he inserted a bunch of tabs, and in my editor, I had not yet set it up to highlight tabs in red and being like, no. And so I was looking at the code, and what, what indentation level error? This, this looks fine, right? And um, that's actually a picture from around the time that my uh, ear was frozen. So I'm on the right, my brother Misha is on the left, and this was the venue that we were going to. We were learning how to dance, and we were waiting for my mom because class had been canceled, and she instructed, she knew it was gonna be a blizzard, she knew it was gonna be cold, and she instructed us to stay inside, but we were kids and we didn't listen to that instruction, and we were out there way longer than we should have been. So I looked pretty pleased, right? Um, after seeing Kurt Chow's talk yesterday, I would also think that uh, the Unicode decode error is a similar kind of problem, right? It's a frozen error for someone else, especially during the Python 2, Python 3 transition. It would have been like, what? What's going on? So another point that I want to make is that places change. So the Walrus operator, which was talked about yesterday, is coming in Python 3.8 will have positional only arguments. Actually, some of my colleagues at Bloomberg um, were helping in the London office help implement that um, for positional only arguments and functions. And then F strings will have this self-documenting expressions on there. So it's also the case that we change, right? So it's not just that the places change, we change. Those are the things that I wanted and enjoyed out of Python 12 years ago when I started are different than what I enjoy about it today and what I seek in a language, in a place that I'm in, right? When you're younger, you, people like to be somewhere where there's a large you know, nightlife and things like that. As you get older, you like things maybe kind of quieter, somewhere where you can just not be disturbed while you're having your morning coffee, things like that. So Ian Bicking has a great post about saying goodbye to Python. And uh, as a reminder, and it's been mentioned in several talks, that Python 2.7 will stop being supported January 1st, 2020. So never, I never want to say I never got to say goodbye to Python, especially Python 2, right? So I'm going to say goodbye to Python 2 in my own way. Um, so I like to write poems, and sometimes they just strike me as a good way to express yourself, and I just let words flow out of me and write them down on paper without thinking too hard about it. In this case, I've, you know, typed it up in the last couple of days. So it's, this isn't gonna be great, right? This isn't, you know, Shakespearean level things, but it's something, right? It's something. So I hope you'll indulge me here. From Dunder Past, import nostalgia. Goodbye, old friend, dear Python 2. A dozen years since I met you, it seems like only yesterday, print was a statement, range returned a list, and X-range was a thing. 
No stars or slashes in my death. Life was simpler. Unicode was, uh, fun? <laughs> Async await were waiting in the wings. Thanks for the memories. You were great. And in memoriam, after you're gone in 2020, I'll still fondly wear a shirt that says, to eight. <laughs> so programmer identity, getting back to this idea. I am a Python programmer. Well, Python is just an adjective here. It's replaceable with a geographic marker. So you could say I'm a Taiwanese programmer, right? And for many of you, that's true. But at the end, I'm a programmer is a more definitive statement about who we are in terms of programmer identity, right? So when you want to leave Python, whether it's for vacation or, you know, at some point, maybe for good, there, maybe there will be greener pastures for us to move on to. Uh, how will you know you're ready? Now, you didn't know there was going to be a quiz from yesterday's keynote. How many were here for yesterday's keynote? Raise your hands. All right. All right. So you'll remember that Professor Lin talked about the hyperbolic tangent, tan h. So that's here in red or reddish color, right? And so most learning is like that. You start off at zero, then you ramp up. And at some point, you start to taper off, right? There's only so much to know about Python. So as you get to the end, it's sort of you're learning at a slower rate. And you're also, it's taking you less effort, right? So the, I, I'm here plotting the first and the second derivatives. Um, this was plotted using matplotlib. I love plotting again. And sometimes I don't get to plot for a while because I don't deal with data the way I used to in grad school anymore. So this was great. I was like, yes, I remember this. Let's remove the axes. Let's make it pretty. Let's put in some styling in there. It was great. So the first derivative is, shows you how much effort it is, right? So that's that sort of bell-like uh, curve. And so as we get to the middle, that is the most effort that it's going to be to learn things, right? And then the second derivative is showing us the change in effort, right? So the change in that effort is, again, it goes to zero, and then it starts to be easier. It gets easier and easier as you get to the bottom, right? Because you're not learning at the same at the same steep slope. So I would say that zero, in this case, serves as the middle point, right? And that is a good time to start thinking about a vacation. Now you might say, how do I know I've gotten to halfway through learning Python as a new programmer or learning any language? And I think the amount of effort that it takes you should be an indicator, right? So if I'm finding myself, oh yeah, this is, I know what I'm doing, I'm sort of cruising along, you're well past that halfway point, and you're ready to keep going. And you're, perhaps you are you're deserve a vacation. You've been working hard, right? depending on how long it took you to get there. And you will get there. It's just I, I fundamentally believe anyone can program, and everyone should program. Not everyone has to do it for a living, but I think everyone should be able to, just like a basic literacy thing, you should be able to write, and you should be able to write programs. They don't have to be great programs, but everyone can do it. So I didn't, I wasn't going to bore you with all the places that I've been in terms of physical places, but I do want to talk a little bit about the programming languages that I sort of went through over the years. So it started off with BASIC. Like you could say I was born in BASIC because that was the first programs that I wrote. And uh, if you're just getting started in whatever language, don't be too bothered if you're feeling like you're just copy-pasting the same things, or you're writing the same program all over again, over and over again. That is what I, I was a kid. So it was shortly after the ear incident, my dad actually bought a computer. He went to, um, he was teaching at a university in Italy for two months, and uh, he was eating just um, concentrated chicken broth. So you're taking concentrated chicken broth, adding hot water to save money to 
go into the duty-free shop on his way back home after two months of saving all that money to be able to buy a computer, our first 286 to bring it home for, for me and my three older brothers to, to play with and for him to be able to do his work, which fundamentally allowed him to then immigrate to the United States uh, using you know, the, the skills and the access to machine that he had by having a machine at home. So I'm very grateful for that. But I didn't, even though I started in basic, I wasn't, I wasn't a great basic programmer. I didn't really know what I was doing. And so I just kept writing the same program of, you know, what is your name? You know, you get that back. And then if name equals Paul, you're awesome. You know, if else, you know, you're terrible, go away. Go clean your room, because it was mostly with my brothers that I would um, talk to or have. Th those were my first users, if you will. My mom probably, too. OK, and then the first programming language where things started to click for me, oddly, was QuakeScript. How many know Quake? So Quake is a first-person shooter. It's one of the original 3D shooters, um, a video game that I played as a kid. It was great, and the thing about Quake is that it had this ability to change what different buttons, when you press different buttons on your keyboard, you could write a little program. So you could change the weapons, or you could change how you walk. So one of the things that I remember seeing, and this is when it started to click, is this idea of um, you can press a button to go to the left, right? And you can press a different button to go to the right. Um, and then you could turn with your mouse, left and right, and then I wrote the, or it wasn't, it wasn't original, I saw someone else, really, because that's how you start to learn the program, right, is you copy someone else. Uh, I saw someone else had made it so that as you take a sidestep, you also turn, and you also turn. So the, this circle strafing al algorithm, right, the very basic thing, was when it started to click for me, oh, I get it. And then I started to write some things to be able to switch what, what weapon my character was holding in the game. And it's like, OK, I see what's going on here. And this was around the time um, that Linux was starting to become very popular. And this is a true story. I switched to using Linux for a very silly reason. I knew that my Quake CD was, you know, had 50 megabytes worth of software on there. The rest were audio tracks, so you could actually, it was neat, you could pull out the CD after the game loaded and put in a different audio CD and listen to that while you were playing your video game, so that was cool. But I knew that, you know, 50 megabytes of stuff, eventually I copied it to the hard drive so I could just play the audio CD whenever I wanted to without having to plug in the, the real CD. 50 megabytes of stuff lived on my computer. But I saw this Linux thing, and the Quake binary for it was 276K. Oh my god, this, is, this must be a super superior operating system. You know, here I was on Windows, what was I thinking, you know, wasting 50 megabytes of space? And it turns out it was just the server. It wasn't the client. It didn't have any of the rendering. It was just pushing the bytes around. But nevertheless, that is my start. And uh, when we moved again, I mentioned the 17 places, I didn't have a lot of friends in the new town that I moved in. So I decided to take C++ at the local community college. So this was right after ninth grade. And so the C++ that I learned in 1999 and 2000 is very different from C++ 11 and 2017. So this is, again, back to that point that programming languages change. Sometimes for the better, sometimes for the worst. You know, everyone is entitled to their own opinions, but that's the way it is. All right. So before we leave Python, let's go for a quiet walk and reflect how we got here. I just told you a lot about how I got here, and I thought you could use just a moment for yourself, so it's not just about me, to think about how did you end up, like what were the first programs that you wrote, what is it that happened here? And um, to sort of help facilitate that, just so that we're not focused on me or anything like that, um, I've recorded, when I started uh, my current job, in, I visited New York, back to places, I visited New York for the very first time three years ago, and I walked through Central Park. 
And in Central Park, I, I have this recorder, which I intended to start recording this talk, but I guess I forgot. Uh, I had this recorder on me, and I recorded just walking around Central Park for an hour. And uh, we're not, obviously we're not gonna play the whole hour here. And let me start recording myself now. So I have this for posterity. Uh, but let's play a little bit of what it sounds like to walk through Central Park and go for a stroll. Oh, and I should plug in the audio, shouldn't I? Pardon me. Ooh. How's that? All right, I don't know how the sound level is going to be. I'll try to. Is that going through? No? Mm. Oh, it's on HDMI output, okay. Yeah, uh, switch, switch it back to your phone. Back to your phone jack. Okay. Is that on Windows or Linux? It's Windows, yeah. Uh, so. Get, get it back to the phone jack. Uh, maybe set it back to presets. Uh, set it to set it. Okay. Thank you. So how was that? Good? It's amazing how, having recorded that three years ago, I can still visualize what path I took for parts of the more salient points of that audio. Right? So I remember where the saxophone player was, and I can feel myself being there. So this embodiment that we have as people right, is so powerful. Right? We should, re should really use this. Um, way of thinking more often. So um, that's one of the things that was motivated me to, to give this very experimental talk that I'm giving to you today. All right, so before we get going, now that we've said our goodbyes, there are some caveats, okay? There is no substitute for experience. 
And what I mean by that is the best that I will be able to tell you about what some of these programming languages are like is like a postcard or a brief summary of my trip to Japan or Germany. Now, I've never been to Japan or Germany, right? So I can't tell you, but I can only learn about it from someone else. And by the way, do you know about PyCon Japan? <laughs> Seems like a great conference. I, I'm sure you haven't heard anything about it, but you should really look into it. It's really good. All right. Another caveat is that my idea of fun isn't necessarily yours, right? So we're all different. And um, for some people, chopping wood is fun. For others, it's painting. For others, it's painting a fence. It might be a roller coaster. That's really fun. Or it might be mountaineering. Right? Being out there in the wilderness alone, risking life for no reason other than you intended to do that. Okay? For others, it might be staying in a fancy hotel. That's also fun. Right? So, to each their own. Okay? So, the things that I might like to, about a programming language won't necessarily be the things that you like about it. Okay, I also like this idea of farming being the original full stack development. Because you kind of get to make all decisions as a small time farmer, right? right? You're situated in a place and you get to decide what kind of crops to grow. And you're not completely doing, you're not like writing the operating system from scratch, right? Like you go out into town and pick up whatever provisions you need, but you're mostly working on your own. You're making your own decisions and you're reaping the benefits of those decisions down the line, right? And then you can think about sort of modern living where we have careers and jobs as sort of removed from that, right? So we don't get to be full stack development, you don't get to have as much impact in any given field because there's so much for you to worry about, right? But as you start to specialize more and more, then you get to zoom in and really focus because everything, you know, everything is works at multiple scales, right? Everything is fractal. As you zoom in, there's more things to zoom in on and more things to zoom in on. So there's, there will never be a shortage of things to do or programming languages to learn or aspects of it to, to work with, okay? So with those caveats out of the way, the first programming language I wanna talk about is Scratch from MIT. Raise your hand if you've ever heard of Scratch or a block, visual block programming language. Okay, so a lot of you have, and those of you who haven't, highly recommend it, particularly parents in the room or when you become a parent and, or if your parent friends say, I wanna get my kid into programming, how do I do it? This is a great way because Scratch eliminates syntax errors. There's no way for you to stitch things together with, that will have an indentation error, right? What's more is that Scratch actually has a notion of typing. So if we look here, so, oh, that's the wrong button. Uh, this doesn't come out on the screen, so we'll just look at the top. Maybe I'll use this. It's all these blocks that are, they're colored different based on what they do. And then the slots inside some of them are actually typed in the sense that this diamond shape, whatever, whatever, that's octagon, hexagon, hexagon, this hexagon, yeah, it's hex six, yes, good. This hexagon shape will only accept expressions, right? So it has to be an expression that goes in there. Uh, if it's a value, that's a circular thing. It's like this oval shape that can go in, inside of expressions like it's this and that, right? And so you, you get the sense of, you know, the square blocks won't fit, fit into the, the circular holes, so you kind of get a sense of what goes where and you don't make mistakes as, someone that's just learning how to program. Um, and so this is a great way of thinking about it. And this might look a little familiar. Daisuke in his talk yesterday mentioned Make Code Arcade, and that's also great. So there's a website, so Scratch is, you run it on the web, and there's actually a community of other programmers that are working on it. Many of them are children that are, that are making drawings, making interactive fiction with it. 
Um, Make Code Arcade is also starting to become a platform like that. And the thing I like about Make Code Arcade is that it gives you a way in to transition from just the visual block into a different language. So in this case, up at the top, you can switch right, between the block representation and the JavaScript representation. And so here you can make mistakes, right? So the guardrails, the bumpers, if you're a bowling fan, come down, right? So you're, you don't have as much safety, but you're, you get more power that way, right? You get to see what's underneath the hood. You can copy pasting is a lot more reasonable in this way than it is on the visual side, of, visual block side of things. Um, a, a wish list item, because I'm up here and I get to you know, wish things, somebody out there should make this for Python. Or tell me that it's already exists and I just haven't found it, right? So to be able to go from the visual block representation to Python representation, right? That's a, that's a reasonable thing. We have the EST module, you can parse some code, figure things out. I think that'd be great. I think that'd be a boon for giving people the ability to reason about their programs in a different way and visualize them. Okay, and so confession time. I do not have a smartphone, I have one of these. And uh, so even if I went to Golang as a country, I wouldn't take photos there. So I wouldn't even have photos to show you, okay? So I'm just gonna talk about Go and how it makes me feel um, and cover some of the points here. So it's true that I write Go code without using syntax highlighting. And the reason I do that is it slows my brain down. I'm forced to think more about what each character means and what it represents, okay? And after a while, it's, it just becomes this quieter thing, right? It's the Central Park feeling as opposed to being on the street, streets of Manhattan. There's not a lot of noise coming at you, flashing red and green and you got a syntax error and it flashes and there's a new thing that pops up and tries to autocorrect for you. None of that is happening in my editor. I just turn off syntax highlighting and I do deal with the errors as they come, but it's just, just a slightly different, it's a slower pace, right? Um, the tooling is very important. And so one amazing feature of Golang is, have you ever written a small Python program that then you wanted to share with a friend, maybe a non-technical friend? Ideally, you just wanna give them binary, right? If you knew what operating system they're on, you're just, here, have this thing, run it, do it. Yeah, good, good luck, Python. If it's pure Python, okay, there are, there are, there are ways you can do Py2exe or similar things on the Mac. But uh, if it's pulling in pandas or numpy or matplotlib, uh, so what you're gonna do is you're gonna, um, hang on, you're gonna, you're gonna go to anaconda, no wait, no, you're gonna go to pip, no, uh, python.org, and it's a mess, right? It's a mess for somebody non-technical to get into our world, and we should be more welcoming, right? We don't need to bring them in to have them programming it the first time. We can give them the benefit of our programs, and Go programmers have it made. So the Go uh, language was bootstrapped from the Plan 9 operating system, which was written at AT&T Bell Labs, which was involved a lot of the original Unix developers uh, and the original developers of C. So the Go compiler is bootstrapped from the C compiler on, uh, from Plan 9. And you only have to take, change two environment variables in any platform that supports the Go programming language in order to create binaries for all the platforms that support the Go um, uh, programming language. So if I'm on this Windows machine and I change that Go OS to Linux or Mac OS, I think they call it Darwin, but regardless, and I iterate, I make a little for loop and iterate over a bunch of different archi architectures, I will have that many binaries made and just, you know, Go build, and I'll have it. And I'll be able to grab a binary, a real binary that doesn't link against libc or anything like that. It just makes system calls at the kernel level, right? So it's completely portable, and you know, a, a small program will, will be fairly small. It might be something like two megabytes or something like that. A binary that you can hand somebody that will do real work for them that they didn't have to install anything, okay? So that's something to think about, something we can learn from a different programming language. Another wonderful thing about Go format is yesterday uh, when Dustin asked, you know, how many know a pep number, everyone said pep eight, right? 
Well, Go format, Go Funct, as they call it, just enforces it at the language level. So every syntactical sort of whether or not we use tabs or spaces, they use tabs. It's okay. Um, whether, uh, how many, you know, how many do we indent before or after, you know, the, the for loop curly brace thing, all of those decisions you, you don't have to worry about. Moreover, Go fix allows you as the language progresses and goes from Go 10 to Go 1.11 to Go 1.17, whatever it is, there's a Go fix program that will fix any syntax changes in the language itself between versions. So it's, it's like Python 2 to 3, except it's actually very, very useful and it works and it's used in production all the time to upgrade real code bases, right? So another thing we could you know, learn from a different programming language. Uh, interesting Go development is that the errors are returned. So whenever you have a function that might error, it returns the value that was being computed and an error placeholder. So either that error is nil or nothing, basically, right? Or it, it is a real error. So whenever you're calling a function that returns these two things, the next thing you're always doing is checking whether or not that error was a real error or not. And so you're always forced as a user to make decisions about errors that might happen. You don't have to know that, oh, I'm gonna call this function, but it might raise this error, so let me do a try and catch except around it. Right, you don't have to do that. It's just in the function, it will, one of the things that it returns if it can error is an error, right? So that's an interesting pattern. Um, so the user gets to deal with it all the time. Another interesting thing that they have is this idea of, you know, you defer something. So something's gonna happen, and in this context, I wanna make sure at the beginning that I dispose of something by the time I'm done falling through this function, but you can write it anywhere in the body. So you can write it right up at the top. Oh, I just use this thing. I want to make sure to call these other things once I'm out of this context, right? And so you just defer that and then it'll, it'll happen for you. You don't have to worry about doing something at the very end, okay? It does have an elegant, robust concurrency model. And that was sort of like the touristy thing that people were excited about Go when it first came out. I was like, oh, I get to use Go routines and channels and be using all these cores, it's gonna be super cool. Um, in practice, I, even though it was neat and I did find myself reaching for the shiny new toy when I started Go programming, I don't use it all that much. It is useful. Um, with channels, you have this idea of uh, typed pipes, so you could pipe values over back and forth, except they're values of a guaranteed type. So again, static typing helps um, sort of make, uh, make your programs a little bit, um, a little bit more robust. Uh, and then interfaces provide uh, safer duct typing. So you define an interface in Go, and any, which was a set of methods that you think an object should have, and any object, regardless of what other things it does, if it has those objects with that kind of signature, you'll be able to use it as that interface type. Okay, so Go, I find, is a programming language that is optimized for teams. You can't get too clever with it. You do end up writing for loops in it to iterate over things. And so it sort of, it looks like it's low level code, but it's very clean. And with all the tooling and the lack of cleverness, you don't have stack decorators with meta classes and things like that. You can't tangle yourself up too much, right? As an excited programmer likes to do, uh, you know, when you learn a new thing, you wanna use it. And the, the new things that you have to use in, in Go, it's pretty much just Go routines and channels. Once you get that out of your system, you're okay, you're just programming, right? With Python, we do have some depth and people get excited about, I'm gonna make a class that's gonna generate another class and wait, I'm not done. It'll do another thing and they'll have this callback registry, right? We can, we can create all sorts of things and, and Go sort of as a language optimizes for the whole team, not just the cleverest people on the team, but everyone. Oh, I have my clicker. All right, experiences in Elm. Elm is a front-end language. It's a functional language that compiles to JavaScript and it's used just to make interfaces. Okay, and if this works, okay. Elm has a clean architecture. You have three things in an Elm program. A model, which is 
state, the things that can change in your program. You have an update function that takes a model and a command and returns a new model. Okay, so that's, you know, that's how you change that state. And then you have a rendering function, where, which takes a model and puts it on the screen, including in, into that user interface, including any command triggers that, you know, on mouse down, do this. On input change, do that. Okay, if this sounds familiar, this is exactly what React and Redux has. And uh, it's in the Elm world, it's called the Elm architecture. And that's where, that's where it comes from. What Elm allows you to do is eliminate runtime errors. So you get a lot more compile time errors in Elm. And again, this is postcard view. You kind of have to believe me or look into it yourself. But when you take that command, for example, right? I said an update function takes a model and a command. Well, a command can be one of you know, five different things. Right? And suppose I added a sixth type of command to my code. Somewhere in that update function, there's a case statement switch, right? For, you know, if command is this, do that. Command is one of the five things that were there originally, do something about it, right? And the Elm compiler will tell me, hey, buddy, how's it going? All right, yeah, you added this new thing here, the six command type, and you didn't take care of it in the following places, in this case statement, in this case statement, and there. So could you take care of that? And we'll be good. So it's amazing how good the error messages are in Elm. It's just fantastic. Um, Elm compiles to JavaScript, but it does allow it to interop with JavaScript. So you have a way, you, there's a support system of speaking to the JavaScript world because you are running it in the browser after all. But, but it's done in the Elm way. And so with code that calls out to JavaScript, those are considered to be impure, and uh, you can't publish to the Elm repository any code that does that. So no library code calls to, calls to JavaScript, which again pushes the responsibility to you, the individual user, of this less safe way of interacting with your, with your JavaScript runtime. So if you want to do it, you're welcome to do it, but we're not gonna allow you to make a mess for other people that, that, that are gonna have to clean up. And at the language level, the semantic versioning is enforced by the language tools. So it's a language where you annotate all your types so you know what everything is, right? And we won't let you, we, the, the Elm compiler, won't let you publish things that keep the same version if any of the APIs have changed. Because it keeps track of all the APIs, right? So if you change the, if you change a type slightly somewhere else, uh, it, you know, in one little thing, you added a new parameter. It'd be like, nope, sorry, you got to bump the version, right? So it again, it makes it easier for you not to hold a foot gun, right? A gun that's pointed at your foot, where the only thing you can do is pull the trigger and hurt yourself, right? Doesn't have, doesn't happen. So that's that's an amazing, refreshing thing that I found about Elm. All right. The last language that I want to talk about is Idris. So Idris is, you probably have never heard of Idris. Anyone heard of Idris? Don't see anyone, yeah, okay, good. Something new, look it up, it's great. Idris looks a lot like Haskell, but it's, it's simpler as a language in terms of its syntax, and it's deeper as a language in terms of the kinds of programs that you write. The, um, it is the most academic of the languages, even though Idris is out to, I think, 1.3 or something right now, and Idris 2 is being worked on, uh, there's not a huge community of Idris programmers out there, uh, much less than Elm, uh, let alone Golang, right? Golang is a major mainstream language. Idris is this academic language right now. But what Idris does have is this notion of dependent types that are very elegantly written in Idris. And what dependent types do is they allow you to not only say, oh, my program takes a string and returns, uh, and a number, say, and returns a list of strings, right? So that might be like repeat a string multiple times and return a list. In Idris, you can say, you can specify that return type as that I'm gonna take a string and a number n 
and return a list of length n of strings. Okay, so you have this expression of the size of the type that is part of the type. Okay, so that's, it's kind of weird, but it allows you to write much tighter programs in that now if you have a list concatenation function, right, and, and address these length, lists that have a length to them, they're called vectors. So if you have a vector of length n, and you want to add it to a vector of length m, the resulting vector should be of length n plus m, right? And so if, it, if your program doesn't do that at the type level, you didn't do your job, right? So it just won't compile, okay? And it might be difficult to reason about this, but bear with me, and this is like sort of as academic as it'll get. Suppose we had a function that removes an element from a list of length n. Okay, so you, you take a list of length n, and you take an element, what should it return? It should return a list of length n minus one, right? That kind of makes sense, except for one thing. How do you know that element was in the list? You didn't, right? You didn't know, you didn't know, and you don't know ahead of time whether or not an element will you know, any given element that could be passed to you will be in that list. So you can't guarantee that the return value will be a length of length n minus one. So how do you get around this? Well, you get around this with proofs. You provide a guarantee that that element will be there. So at some point earlier in the program, before you try to call this function, you have a check for whether or not this element is indeed in that list of length n. And if it is, you, your function now t also takes the proof as the argument and accepts it. It's a, if it's a valid proof, then it's fine for you to return a list, list of length n minus one. If it's not, if you do a check if that element is in the list and it wasn't in the list, then you are forced as a programmer to decide what to do in that case because you're not gonna be allowed to call that function that returns n minus one elements anymore. Right? Because you don't have proof that that element is in there. In fact, you have proof that it's not in there. Right? So you can guarantee that the thing that will be, uh, yeah, th that the thing will not be in there. So you can't call, I'm sort of repeating myself here. I hope that wasn't too difficult, but I hope I've sort of like itched an interesting part of your brain that goes, huh, I didn't know programming with types could be sort of this, this safe and this fun. The other thing that um, is fun about Idris is the auto-generation of code. So a lot of the code that, that and it's similar to, to the, the Elm world, so suppose we had some command type that could be, it, it, that was a union type of, of you know, five different things. In Idris, with integrate, uh, it allows you to integrate with your text editor where you can say, oh, can you do me a case statement for all the things that that command can be? And it will come back to you, you know, filling all those five different possibilities out with stubs for what, and they're, they're called holds in Idris, with what should go in there next. It's sort of a placeholder, like now you decide what the next steps to do. And so it's this, because of the richness of the type system, the, writing of code becomes much more of a dialogue. The linter and the compiler isn't babysitting you saying, you missed this, you missed that, you missed that. You're asking it like, what should go here? Oh, okay, what should go here? Yeah, yeah, that, that sounds good. What should go here? And then you can kind of, in any one of those holes, you can look around and say like, hey, so what, what's available to me here? Like, what are the things that I can use? And it'll tell you like, oh, in this context, you have the following variables and here are their types, things like that. Um, oh, I have a typo there. Um, yeah, and basically with the type development, anything that is a function can be, become a type. So functions can return types. So based on the value that is passed into a function, you can get different types out of it. So it's like this weird, cool thing. I hope it catches on because it's really, it feels refreshing to work in it. So maybe you'll get a chance to go on vacation in Idris at some point. Maybe you'll decide to go there, right? All right, so talked a lot about work. All work and no play makes everyone dull. So I'm gonna 
This is going to be sort of now for something completely different. Um, I run these events in the San Francisco office. Uh, I've now run five of them, uh, and I call them open studios. And the reason I do that is explicitly, and they're called Jupyter Open Studios, is explicitly to call out to this idea that we don't always have to be doing purposeful things. Right? So somebody might complain to me and say, Idris is so academic, I could never get a job doing it. That's not the point, right? Like, you can't get a job in the Galapagos. That doesn't mean you shouldn't go there, right? To change the way that you think about the world. And so with these open studio events, I sort of distinguish them from hackathons as we're not trying to accomplish anything. We're just trying to bring community together of local Jupyter developers, and anyone is welcome. Like I said, we run them about uh, four times a year. Um, and so I just want to show some photos of what an open studio looks like and, and talk a little bit about it. So this is an empty room. We also have a big screen in our office. This one is bigger and more impressive. Um, but uh, an event starts off as empty, right? And again, back to programming languages as places, what matters are the people that show up, not so much what the place looks like. OK, and then I do this, um, oh, the color shows up there. That's great. I do this icebreaker activity. Um, I'm going to try to do it all the time. I've missed it a few times, where you tell me three things, or you write them down on a sticky so that you can share with other people. One thing that you want to learn, so this is an event that takes place in our office over two days, so people can come either on a Friday or on a Saturday or both days, because not everyone can take time off from work to just learn and improve themselves. And on the other hand, not everyone can take time away from family instead of um, uh, doing more work and sort of uh, professional development. So one thing that you want to learn, oh, excuse me. Uh, one thing that you want to share with others while you're there, and then one thing that you want to try while you're there, okay? And then that allows people to talk. You might recognize Carol Willing, who was here two years ago as a keynote speaker. Um, people end up working part of the time, but part of the time they're just sharing their ideas and sharing their workflows, right? So I like to think of an open studio as an extended hallway track. It's when you go to a conference, yes, the talks are important. I'm very thankful that you're all here. But right after this is a perfect continuation of the conference. And um, in the hallway, you get to learn a lot more, right? And so I wanted to make a whole event that is just about the hallway track. That's what open studios are. I'm going to sort of speed through this as we're running out of time. But you kind of get the feeling of it. Um, by the way, on the left here, that's my dad. My dad is still a software developer. And now, just in the last year, uh, or maybe two years, uh, he started working for NVIDIA, and he is now learning Python. And he has been telling me, he's been calling me for help uh, when he has a syntax error or when he has a particular thing. It's fantastic. It's a great way to turn the tables, right? Here's the person that used to teach me about C++. I'm now helping him uh, learn Python or figure things out and do his workflow. Uh, coffee is, go back a slide, coffee is very important, right? So I'm very glad we have both coffee and tea here. We have both coffee and tea in the office as well. And people are working. That was Carol again. There's whiteboards. There's private conferences. It's a good time. Your friends are willing to make silly faces and do little fun things. Um, feeding them is important. There's food as well. We do have a session for lightning talks. Um, and so this was, um, this was a couple of Cal Poly interns that uh, they're still in college. They were working with the Project Jupiter over the summer. And here they're showing off this rich text editor for uh, WYSIWYG markdown editing. So up on the right, you can see you can just click bold and italics and underline for, again, non-technical users. So they were showing that off in the most recent event. and. Uh, yeah, more of that. And then my friends indulge me in doing silly photos with me, so that's always fun. And in the end, they all leave, right? And it's, again, this is back to, it's the people that matter. The event is an event, that's great, but it's the people that were there that matter. 
All right, I just have a few uh, more minutes. This is similar in spirit, again, in the hallway track I found out yesterday to a local event, this hackathon that GovZero puts on. And I'm very impressed that you've had 37 events since 2012, and uh, you keep doing them and keep happening. It's fantastic, it's great. I was also very grateful for all the English that was written in, in the slides, in the talks that weren't in English, because I was able to follow them, so I thought I'd return the favor and uh, not just have exclusively English slides for you. Okay, so we have 30 seconds left and a quest appears. So there's something wrong. So this is a screenshot from the website, from the GovZero Hackathon website. There's something wrong with it. But it's a little bit blurry. You're probably having a hard time seeing it. So what if we say, you know, zoom in and enhance? <laughs> I can't believe that worked. It's amazing. Can anyone tell me what's wrong? It's about the dates. Data at the top says 2019-07-20, that's July 20th. But down below it says 097, right? So what needs to happen, your mission, should you choose to accept it, is go to that repository, which is where the code lives, and change the date from, because the last event was on September 7th, as far as I can see. So any one of you that's never made a pull request before, I encourage you to go do that. Go do that right now. Go open up GitHub and, and do that. Okay. I'm just gonna three more slides and I'll wrap up. Um, a friend of mine, Stefan Vanderwalt, sent me an email nine days ago, saying, "I love the the premise of your PyCon Taiwan talk. When where can I see it? As though I had already delivered it." I was like, "I should have asked, Stefan. Wh where did you? Are you? Do you just follow like?" How did you know about this? But anyway, I didn't ask that. But I did ask, what do you mean? What would you like me to talk about? What is it that you're getting out of my abstract? Which is, I gathered what, what he was talking about. And so, Stefan, being the great friend that he is, wrote me a very long email. And I'll just let you read that on your own for a few seconds, but it was fantastic that uh, he got the spirit of what I'm trying to talk about with thinking about programming places, uh, programming languages as places, which is that we can visit other cultures, we can get the benefit of them, we can import them into our world, we can export our good ideas into the up and coming programming languages and help shape them, help them not make the mistakes that our languages sort of went through and the pain points and things like that. So that's, that's just great. Um, that's a picture of my whole family, that's my dad up at the top again, I'm on the very right. and. Uh, the great thing about programming, thinking about programming languages as places is that unlike real physical places, it doesn't cost us anything in terms of time or money, really, to switch and to go somewhere else, right? It took me a while to get here from California, but if I want to go to Golang, I could just open up my laptop right after this talk and switch, right? Another amazing thing and this is why I have the photo up here, is again, unlike the physical world, you can also go back in time. It's a time machine. You don't, have to, you don't get to just travel in terms of physical places, you get to time travel. Because you can still go back and use C++ 11, or you can still go back and use Python 2.6 if you liked it so much. It's amazing, right? The technology allows us to do that. It's great. So with that, I want to thank you for your time and attention. Here are some resources related to this, and I'll put the slides up so that you can, um, you can take advantage of those. There are some similar ideas that were covered. Uh, Stacy Morse was instrumental in uh, helping me uh, define Open Studios when I came up with the concept, um, and she has a great PyCon talk about using art critique principles for code reviews. So that's fantastic. Uh, livable Code by Sarah May is a similar idea zoomed in. If you think about your code base, as a living room or as a house that you share with a bunch of people, you're gonna act a certain different way. You're not gonna leave a mess for somebody else to clean up because you dropped the glass of milk by the fridge, right? You're gonna clean that up. And so um, there's some others, and as promised, here's my contact information. Thank you so much. So let's thank our captain for this awesome journey again. And thank you. Thank you.
Thank you. And we still have time for maybe a few questions. And there is one on Slido. Oh, great. Yeah. And in some scenario, programmers need to go into a machine code, like performers, debugging, and extra, et cetera. Mm -hmm. Would you like to share some thought on assembly? Yeah, assembly is, is a great language. I, I still remember writing assembly was because I got to take um, programming before I got to college. In college, the first programming language I took was assembly. And I still remember learning the XOR swapping trick, uh, where you can, you can change two values. The, anyway, look it up, XOR swapping. It's great. Um, but yeah, sometimes you do need that performance. And uh, my thought is, do it. Yeah, sometimes, right? sometimes it's much easier for me to get something by going to a different place. Right? If I wanted, if I wanted, you know, if I wanted to have really good bubble tea, I'm better off coming here, right? Sure. <laughs> Clearly, everyone knows that. <laughs> yeah. And another question is a, a easier one. Okay. What's the font of your slide use? The font of your slide. The font of my slide. I don't know. Uh, I, this was from uh, DeckJS, so it is the neon theme in DeckJS that I switched. The um, I mixed fonts. I'm I'm really sorry about that. But this font I think is Fira Code, the the sort of the fixed uh, monospace font. That's what I use in, in my terminal um, because it has pretty arrows. If you have like a greater than equal sign, it'll be a nice unified fat arrow. So F I R A Code is that font. Cool. So is there any question downstairs? Uh, I actually have uh, one final question for that. Sure. Uh, I heard that there are rumors or, about Python 4. Also, do, you, do you think um, in the future Python will apply, so, for example, uh, for semantic versioning or some of the advantage of other languages you mentioned in today's talk? Yeah, interesting question. And uh, any answer I give will be pure speculation. So I'd, yeah. I'd love to purely speculate, but uh, yeah, uh, I, don't, I don't have no idea. So is there any question? If, if there's no question, then let's thank Paul for, for, uh, and give him a final round of applause. Oh, I, before we go, I do have a bunch of stickers. So if you want a Jupyter sticker or anything in the Python ecosystem, I brought a bunch of them. So please feel free to stop by. Yeah, thank you.